Hello, my name is Dick Finney. Welcome to my show. Today we're going to visit a couple of museums in the Chicago area and then watch the Grand Excursion Riverboat Tour on the Mississippi River. And then we'll finish off with a visit by the Challenger engine, the largest steam engine still in operation. Thank you. We're heading into Chicago. Our first stop is the Museum of Science and Industry, located on beautiful grounds on the south side of Chicago along Lake Michigan. The first thing you see as you enter from the underground garage is the Pioneer Burlington Zephyr. This experimental streamlined train built in 1934 had the first diesel electric engine. It was made up of three stainless steel cars. It was smaller and lower than other trains of the time to have less wind resistance. All of the doors were head bumpers. The streamlined wheel trucks are located at the joint between two cars. This way the ride is smoother and the jostling between cars is eliminated. This has a disadvantage. Cars cannot be uncoupled without special lifting equipment. The streamlined observation car comes almost to a point at the back. The windows are frosted. Movie projectors are placed in the wall to project on the windows. The effect will be obvious when we visit the inside later. Inside the train, the quarters are close. The engineer's seat is right at the front, sandwiched between the wall and the front of the generator. The diesel engine is right behind him. But you'd never forget that first time you sat in the engineer's seat on the Pioneer's ever and you looked down at it. This, this is the baggage car and the man is sort of a ghost is explaining how it operates. He sort of appears right out of the middle of the car. Because there's nothing worse than the RPO than getting to the other end of a run before you sorted out all the mail. That's called going stuck. Mail that's gone stuck eventually gets to its destination. But it shows it all the bags of mail and the cubby holes behind him. It explains about the uh, how they dropped the bags off and picked them up on the hook on the way back. You know what they say, the mail must go through. A high-speed dawn to dusk trip was planned from Denver to the Chicago Exposition in 1934. Crossing guards watched at every roadway and switches were welded so that no other train could encroach on the line. In the middle car you can talk with some of the permanent passengers. Rocking and rail sounds are simulated. Delicious fried chicken, roast beef sandwiches, fruit preserves, and hot strong coffee with not a drop spilled. The ride is smooth as silk. There it is. That's all you need to know. We are in the observation car in first class. Come on run. in, folks. Welcome to the observation lounge. Pleased to meet you. I'm Ralph Budd. Mommy, look, we're going over a bridge. And these are my friends, Mrs. Catherine Wilder and her daughter, Abigail. Hello, Abby. Say hello. Hello. Really, Ralph, do you think it's a good idea having all these scruffy people come in here? They don't really look like first-class passengers. Well, Catherine, I think it'll be just fine. They all seem very well-behaved. They just want the best view of the Zephyr's run. Well, I do hope you're right, Ralph. But they really should know. <clears throat> 
all you visitors, please be aware that this is a first class car and you should all appreciate Mr. Bud sharing it with you today. Mommy, now look! What now, dear? Can't you see? We're about to go through a town. Can you see the crossing guards out along the tracks, Addy? They're to make sure the Zephyr doesn't have any accidents today. Where are they? I can't see them. I agree, Abby. It is difficult to see the landscape. In some ways, Ralph, don't you think it's almost a shame the Zephyr moves so quickly? Ah, but Catherine, in the 20th century, the race goes to the swift. The railroad simply must keep up. Mommy, now we're passing a car. They can't keep up with us. Amazing. The Zephyr is safer, more comfortable, and even faster than our finest automobiles. A new record was set from Denver to Chicago in 13 hours. That figures out to be about 77 miles per hour average, with much higher speeds out on the prairie. in a ceremony to Mr. Ralph Budd of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. Flash bulbs pumping, everyone cheering. I see Mr. Budd wink to the news reporters. Then he said, the train I was to ride on, you got it, the Burlington Zephyr. They have a Spitfire and a Stuka hanging overhead. Very few Stukas survived the war. This one was found in the African desert in about 1955. There's the Stuka and the Spitfire again. A Boeing 40 mail plane. And also a 737. Mounted right in here as part of the building now. Although that is Craig Beedlove's Spirit of America land speed record car. The Travel Air Mystery Ship. And a big old locomotive. Huh? Locomotives, this one ran on, on the ground, it didn't have rails. A replica of the rocket, the first locomotive on a public railway, Liverpool to Manchester in England in 1830. A replica of the 1827 Tom Thumb. The Baltimore and Ohio was the first operating railway in the United States. 1929 racer. Frank Hawks flew this plane from LA to New York in 12 hours and 25 minutes in 1930. The sights and sounds of a modern jet flight. Take off, the gear is going up. the flaps and spots and everything out there. Cross country is much faster. This plane will make the same trip in less than five hours. A flight under the stars. Gear coming down, flaps extended. Reverse engine deflectors and wing slots open to slow down. 
arrival. Inside the cockpit. This is the Illinois Railroad Museum. It is located near the village of Union, northwest of Chicago. Old control house. Had control for all the switches at one time here. The East Union Depot. Ticket office. And the waiting room. Then 1851. It's the oldest depot west of Pittsburgh. It's still in operation as a railroad depot. Railway, railway Express cart. We're with by the old time streetcar. Still has electric wires overhead. Snowfall. This is the locomotive barn. A Norfolk and Western articulated compound engine. The steam goes first to the smaller primary cylinders, then the exhaust is reused in the larger secondary cylinders. Both are about the same horsepower. This is the front set of cylinders, and notice the huge diameter to them. These are the uh, secondary steam used after the primary cylinders, which are partway back on the side here. It's a 2884. There's eight drivers. Comes along here is the second cylinder. This is the primary cylinder. They're a little smaller than the ones in the front. And then there are eight more drivers. And then the cab and the tender. This is the later Burlington Zephyr. This is the one that ran on most of the lines. It was a full size passenger engine that has the silver streak motive to it. This particular one called the Silver Pilot. This ran on the Burlington lines for many years. But it's somewhat different than the original one that had the, uh, this has a separate engine. The original one, the engine was in the first car along with the baggage. The connection from the engine to the first car does not have a common truck under it, so it can be easily uncoupled. 
have a complete train here all connected together. It's known as the train of the gods because the cars all had the names of Greek gods. This one is the Venus. Well, the engine could be disconnected. The cars were actually still connected together and still operated with a common truck underneath. You can see here's one truck that goes completely from one car to the other. Both cars swiveled on this truck. So what became one solid articulated train? They could be separated and the length of the cars changed, but it took a major operation in the railroad yard to do it. The front of this is painted to match the original car and the, the stripes are about where the windshield would be and they even have a dummy grill painted on above the windshield just like the original Pioneer did. But the thing about this is that it's this much bigger. The Pioneer was just about this height and all the, the later ones were that much bigger. The whole train is a much bigger scale than the Pioneer was the one that made the cross-country run. The train has an observation car just like the original, but it's considerably bigger and wider, but it has the same pointed end, and there it says on the back, Nebraska Zephyr. Beautiful all stainless steel train. They called a velocipede. It operated on one rail and had the outrigger that ran on the other rail. It was hand powered by moving the handlebar back and forth through a connecting rod and a set of gears drove it forward. It was for section crews to get to out on somewhere on the track, maybe one or two men. And they're easy to put on and off the track because they're lightweight. And of course, with the, the old hand car that usually had two men operating it, but pumping up and down on the handles. It had a foot operated brake on the side. 59 horse car was pulled on the rails in the center of the street before the advent of the electric motor. It was like this that were modified in Eau Claire in 1889 to become the fourth city in the world to have electric streetcars. Full of many different types of uh, streetcars and interurban cars, going from the very oldest, continuing on. They come in all different sizes. They compare the height of this one, it's a very low slung car, and compare that to the one next to it, which is very high and ungainly car was driven by a cable running under the street, much like the San Francisco cars are, and still are. The thing that was unique about this, the cable system ran through a tunnel under the river, was the only way they could get across the Chicago River because all the bridges were drawbridges. So they uh, made a tunnel for the streetcars to go through underneath so that the cable could pull them through all the way. Some more modern ones with modern metro systems that are stored outside. In front of the North Shore Electroliner, very similar looking to the uh, Burlington Zephyr, only this was just an interurban uh, North Shore commuter train, all electric. Both ends look the same, it could be driven in either direction by the controller on either end. These ran in, in the late 30s as when the competition of the uh, streamliners on the other lines were evident. 
The more modern engines uh, store it outside. cars and, and uh, railway cars in this barn. I'm on the back where presidential candidates used to make their speeches on their cross-country junkets. Presidential suite. The brass bed. Even a dining room. You can take a longer ride on a later model of the Chicago streetcar. In 2004, the largest flotilla of steamboats gathered on the Mississippi River in more than 100 years. The week-long tour started at the Quad Cities on June 25th and continued to St. Paul for the final Big Bash on July 4th. These movies were shot on July 1st. It's quite a tall boat. The Celebration Bell was built in 1986 and is the largest excursion boat on the Upper Mississippi. Here he's going into the Alma Locks. While it's going through, we will drive up to Buena Vista Park overlooking the town from 700 feet above. So the celebration bell is just leaving the Alma Lock. There are three more waiting to come in. The Julia Bell Swain was built in Dubuque in 1971 and is now based at La Crosse, Wisconsin. We have lots of watchers up here at the Buena Vista Park. It's sitting pretty good. I don't pull easy. Just going in the locks here. I don't know what the name of this one is. Oh, that's a St. Louis something. Look at it. Oh, yeah, it's it does. All wrong. The Spirit of Peoria, the floating wedding cake. It was built in Paducah, Kentucky in 1988 by the Walker Boatyard. It was propelled by steam driven paddle wheel. The Anson Northrop. Now they're coming out of the Alma Lock.
This is the Julia Bell Swain out of La Crosse. This is the Peoria, Spirit of Peoria. The Paddleford Packet Boat, it's out of St. Paul. Turn on the paddle on the side wheeler. They're wide and round. Like we're having a little race here. The Clyde may represent a workboat once owned by the Ingram and Kennedy Mill in Eau Claire. And then soon to be eclipsed by a train.
the Harriet Bishop. I believe that's out of St. Paul, too. Rides up in that area. Like Harriet Bishop was the first school teacher in Minnesota or something. Is that right? Yeah. He's riding a little deep in the water, isn't it? This okay. one looks like a car of engineers. Yeah, boat. that's it. This double stack there in the red. Yeah. Wabasha, Minnesota. Big grand uh, occasion for the grand excursion arriving. There's lots of tents up for concessions. We even have some music here. They caught up with them at Wabasha again. This is the spirit of Peoria and the Paddleford Packet. The Ensign Northup was named for a Minnesota pioneer who ran one of the first boats to ply the Mississippi above St. Anthony Falls. This one was built in 1988 and operated by the Paddleford Company of St. Paul. Spirit of Peoria, very ornate. Celebration sprang up in towns and villages all up and down the river. from La Crosse. A very fine boat. Sure does. This one is backing away. Spirit of Peoria is going to leave. Different boats stop at different ports along the way. They have breakfast cruises, harbor cruises, dinner cruises, and moonlight cruises. All were planned at the many stops. A long time since we've seen something like this on the river. Julia Bell Swain is built on the old tradition with a big pilot wheel and the exhaust beam vented through scape pipes 
rather than being recycled back through the system as most modern boats are. It has been used in many movies and TV commercials. south and one going north. Uh. Of course, it's taking a rest. He's been pulling this coach all day long. I guess you'd call that a Lando. Fastness of Lake Pippin. The Delta Queen was part of the excursion too, but it had gone up river the night before. It was built on the Sacramento River in California in 1926 as a troop ferry. In 1946 it was brought through the Panama Canal to the Mississippi River and converted into an overnight passenger boat. I finally caught up with the Delta Queen that's tied up at the marina at Lake City amongst all the sailboats. We found the Celebration Bell at Pepin for a big party. Complete with old cars. I'm not cold. Maxwell and a 1903 Cadillac. Cadillac is in the back. Oh, it's fringe on top. This is a 1903 Orient buckboard. I got him all by himself. A Model T Ford runabout. And Roach and Lang electric. It has a tiller for steering. And just two pedals. Go and stop. Ford Phaeton. Uh, the celebration bell. Eh? The Mississippi Queen was also part of the tour, 
but it didn't arrive until the next day. It was held up in Hannibal, Missouri by high water and a low bridge. For not Dick, because uh, yeah. those were kids. <laughs> We were so early, we thought maybe we got the wrong year or something. Yeah. The Union Pacific Challenger number 3985 made an excursion trip from its home in Cheyenne, Wyoming to St. Paul, Minnesota on September 26, 2008. Its top speed is 70 miles an hour. The engine has a 4664 wheel arrangement. It is articulated and hinged in the middle. There are four small wheels and six big drivers, then six more big drivers driven by separate cylinders, and then four more small wheels under the cab. It's like two separate engines under one big boiler. The cylinders are 21 inches in diameter with a stroke of 32 inches. The drive wheels are 5 foot 9 inches in diameter. This is the largest steam engine still operating in the world. The Union Pacific big boys were larger, 2884s, but none are still running. The engine and tender are 121 feet long and weigh 537 tons. The tender has 14 wheels and carries 25,000 gallons of water and 6,500 gallons of fuel oil. It was built in 1943 by the American Locomotive Company. retired in 1962, then restored in 1981, and is kept in running condition for excursions like this one.
We got caught in a highway detour and lost track of the train. We went directly to St. Paul and waited for hours only to find it was stopped in South St. Paul to fill its huge water tank. Well, I don't know much. Are you a train buff then? I remember my story, right? Train coming from behind. Looks like you might be able to.
beyond the Whoopi Bridge up here? Yeah. What is it, Kellogg we want? Yeah. And then we're going to turn right again. We are? After we turn the corner. We are? I'll show you over there. We just hope we are. I got to see. Kellogg? Well, that's all for now, folks. Tune in again next time for more history, travel, and planes, trains, and automobiles. Thank you.